welcome our next headlight talk speaker. Super excited to speak with you today. Hi everyone, I'm Apurva and I am a user experience researcher at Microsoft in India. So I I didn't mention that I work at SAP, and we're gonna speak to you guys about our experiences as women in tech, um, especially as UX researchers. Um, but first, we want to talk to you guys about how we met. Um, so Interestingly, we both worked at IBM um, many years back, and um, that's how we met. I was running and leading a design boot camp in India for all the new hires uh, in design and research, and I reached out to Tyler to just see if she was willing to present um, some topic to these you know, new hires, and um, interestingly, she had a very unique approach to it. She asked me what the audience was like and what were the cultural nuances for presenting a topic like storytelling in India. And she wanted to know more about you know, the users that she was going to speak to. And uh, that is when I thought, wow, this is a cool lady. She cares about who the audience is, what their cultural nuances are. And that's how we became friends. And after, very shortly after that, we, we went on our clicker? separate ways. Do we have a clicker or something? I don't have a clicker. OK. okay. Uh, we went on our separate ways, and we left IBM. I went to SAP. Apoorva went to Microsoft, and so now we're living out our best long-distance bestie relationship right now, and we communicate mostly through voice notes. Uh, so we talk about like the usual girly stuff. We have like cute relationship stories. We got wedding planning drama. Oh my god! Um, but we also talk about more serious topics. We talk about our career journeys, our career growth, UX research methods, and we thought about this a couple, a lot actually. And we were like, this would be really great for us to share, like all of our little tidbits we have would be really great for us to share on more of a global stage to other researchers and other women in tech. Um, and one topic that came up a lot as like super relevant and very interesting was our different first days at our different companies um, when we left IBM. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about mine. Uh, when I started as a UX researcher at Microsoft, I had a one-on-one -on -one lunch with a PM lead and um, it was like a great, um, supposed to be a great lunch, but tell me how many of you have heard this, like clap if you've heard this. We don't need research, PM can do interviews. Yeah? Okay. Um, this is the first lunch we ever had, the it first introduction to the company, and I was stumped. Um, but what this led to is, and what this could lead to many others is a, a power imbalance between two functions in the same team, and second, a lack of trust between two individuals, right? I'm gonna elaborate what that means. Um, when I'm new in a company, when I'm working with someone, uh, trying to understand how they operate, how research works, how PM works, if they are already in a mindset where, um, you know, we don't need research, it kind of makes me feel like okay, I'm going to have to prove my value to not just this person, but this team and this function so that they can make use of the research insights that I have. And now my job becomes not just doing research, it becomes doing research and proving my value. Um, second thing, lack of trust, which is now I know that maybe there's not that much growth in here for me because if this is how leads and leaders are thinking about research, then are they going to even invest in my career? Are they going to, you know, like sponsor things, lead, my, lead to my career growth, all of those questions, right? So, yeah, these are potential things that can happen to anyone who's working in research and facing these problems. So my first week was a little bit different. So I'm part of SAP's central design team. So I'm part of like a central research team. I get rented out to different teams across SAP. So I join lots of different lines of business. But I hear this 
with pretty much every new team that I join. So give me a clap if you've heard this one. We don't really know what research is, but we're not going to stop you. So it's nice that people are not stopping me and I can do whatever I want. That's very cool. But what this sentiment can lead to is one, autonomy for me, very fun. I get to flex my research muscles. I get to be the queen of the research, which is cool. But it implies a need for education. These teams don't know what UX research is. They don't know how to leverage it effectively. So I have to teach them. And because I'm shifting teams so often, I can't stay on a team long enough to help them build the muscle memory of doing good research and embedding research practices in their product life cycle. So there becomes this very short-term inclusivity of research. They're like, we won't stop you. You can do it. But if I leave, are they going to do research? Probably not. So we've seen a couple different types of defensive reactions from our stakeholders when we bring up research findings. I come across the externalized type of defensive response more frequently. So I hear things from my stakeholders if I bring up challenging insights and I hear, well, it's already committed in the roadmap. Like, I can't do anything. I don't know. So they blame it on an external force that they can't act on my insights. But if Horvath does, sees the, ex, the internalized. Yeah. The one that I see most often is an internalized defense reaction. And this is really about you know, how my research findings are going to make somebody else look bad. So for example, if I point out that these are the areas of improvement or these are the pain points that users are facing, and um, someone else, like a PM or a dev, you know, they might think that, oh, I haven't done a good enough job. And this is a reflection of my work. And therefore, you know, research is actually exposing me or like making me look bad. So that's a very internalized defense reaction. So our hot take we took from this is that whether you're in the East or you're in the West, researchers, we all have problems. We all have basically the same problems. They just manifest a little bit differently. But we are researchers. We are really good at understanding human behaviors. And we basically dissect human behavior every single day. So let's take a look at how we are approaching this problem that we've identified. Um, Assume all our stakeholders are our users, and we are going to treat them as archetypes, because that's what researchers do. And let's assume there's an archetype X. This archetype is basically someone who doesn't trust research. Um, and this really comes from uh, what we spoke earlier about internalized defense mechanisms, right? And they don't allow UX research to be a part of the process, because they are set in their own ways, and it's so rigid to change the system, to change the process, that uh, it's just easy for everybody to move fast and to like exclude research from the system and just do or build products based on the localized knowledge or like limited knowledge uh, about this one user said this thing, so I'm going to build something, or this one VP wants me to do something, so I'm going to build this thing. So it's really um, this X archetype. So the archetype that I come across that I kind of mentioned in my story was the archetype who just doesn't understand research. They're not necessarily scared of it, but they don't necessarily think to incorporate it into their decision-making process, into the product development life cycle. So they don't really, they're not really able to act on it, right? And so if we take the two archetypes and we make them into a Venn diagram, we can see that there's an intersect. And we see that stakeholders often just don't know how or when to pull UX research into their product lifecycle. So what ends up happening is they just can't do anything with research, which is a challenge, and it actually has some impacts. So the most obvious impact is that there's an, there's an impact on the user. If users are continually struggling with the same things, they're not going to be very happy, and they're going to keep having pain points. But it also impacts the product, duh, right? Um, but the thing I want to call out here is that it can actually impact the product's trust and credibility. Because if users who are doing research with us are continually expressing the same problems and they're continuing to experience the same issues and they're not resolved, our trust and our credibility as product and as researchers gets degraded. And then it has an impact on us as researchers. We're on the front lines with the users, we're friends with them, we talk to them, and we have to continually see them struggle, and that's really painful for us as researchers. Um, but 
uh, we will also leverage these archetypes to create some positive impact. Let's see how. Um, the method that I have used in my career is to let the work speak for itself, let the research do its job, um, and generate some actionable insights for the tip, build confidence in the product, or show the future roadmap for the team, right? Create excitement about it. So this is something that works, that has worked well for me, because I was able to do like end-to-end -end research on a particular product or a user group um, without worrying too much about who is thinking what, who is going to stop me, um, who is going to you know, be a blocker for me. Just show value in incremental ways. So do like a small study, maybe like an exploration, show problems, show ways to, add in, to address them, do like a quick evaluative study to show you know, immediate, tangible action items, but breaking down the whole research into like smaller, incremental, um, value-building documents could like be a great way to build that confidence. And what this has led for me personally in my career growth is that my research was um, shared out broadly outside of Microsoft with the partner community, and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of respect and there's a lot of value that um, I was able to generate for my own team, which means that anyone who comes next or who does research from my team are going to be seen um, more respectfully. And uh, that is because someone did the work, um, someone just showed the insights, showed how the product could be improved. That's that. All right, my story is a little bit different. Um, on one of my previous teams, I was working directly with an engineering executive, and we were in a meeting outside of our team, and he ended up undermining my authority. He like totally made me look bad in front of people that weren't in our team. He made me look like a bad researcher. He made it look like I didn't know what I was doing because he kept pushing back on, on my decisions that I was trying to drive. And I was like, no, 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 this is really bad. So I went to my mentor, who's a director. She's awesome. I love her. Everybody get a mentor. And I said, hey, Dave did this thing, and I don't really like it. And she, I don't know if I want to like, say anything to him. I don't know if I want to escalate. And she said to me, well, do you want him to do it again? And I said, no. And she said, all right, you got to address it then. So I actually ended up confronting this kind of scary engineering executive, and I said, hey, man, you did this, I don't know if you meant to, but you totally, totally screwed me in that meeting. And I need you to not do that again, one, but I really need you as a man to be my advocate. I need Whoa. you to advocate for me <laughs> as a young lady in corporate America because I need your voice because your voice sometimes can hold more weight, especially because you're an executive. I need you to be my advocate. He immediately apologized, which was great. But more importantly, we started building an equal partnership and he became my biggest cheerleader. He became my ally. And he actually opened doors and created new opportunities for me because he really took it to heart when I said, you got to advocate for me. He said, all right, bet, let's go. So he created opportunities for me to share my work in front of customer audiences and executive audiences, and he elevated my voice. So very happy ending to a very scary situation. I was like, ooh. Um, but how do we do this? Yeah. Um, we short, basically, yeah. yeah, short, like in a very short, answer, we built human connections. Because if you look at Tyler's story, she worked with a human, confronted him. I basically worked with a team of people where there was a lack of trust, but built that trust, which is really like a human value. Um, there's a lot of actionable tips that we have for you, and we're going to get into the depths of each of these. But really quickly, building the human connection, advocating for yourself, and assuming the best intentions of the person in front of you. Um, how do we build and nurture human connections? There's three ideas that we have for you. This is work for us. A, build friendships. And this does not mean that, you know, you go out partying with someone, you know, tell them your dirty secrets and, you know, just be friends for life. No, that's not it. What we're asking you to do is maybe go on one-on-one -on -one lunches that means something um, you know, where, where you can talk about work, your own career aspirations, what are you here to do in your job. And this has personally uh, been working very well for me because I used to work remote and then I started going to office and doing these one-on-one -on -one lunches really helped because it builds the trust of, like, between two people just in simple ways like, oh, this person said that they're going to be at this spot at 12 o'clock and they're there. 
builds trust. It's very small, but it actually does build trust. Next, bitch together. And again, we don't mean that you gossip about someone, spread rumors about someone, or like be mean to someone. We simply mean that both of you, you know, you and your stakeholders, are disadvantaged by a system. Um, and what we're asking you to do is challenging that system together. Maybe your ways are different, but you're going to find more commonality with each other, and you're going to find like, you know, both of you could break some system or like challenge the status quo and reach to a favorable outcome that works for both of you. So that's what we mean by bitch together. And third is finding allies, and like Tyler did herself, is you know uh, find folks who can elevate your voice, who can um, see the goodness that you have, and just ask them to kind of keep doing that and um, find more people like that. It makes it feel special when you say, I need your help. People are like, yes, I can help somebody. That makes me feel good. Yeah. And why do we recommend those three, um, three things? Is because it builds trust. It also appeals to someone else's logical part of the brain, where you know, you're thinking about credibility and the emotional intelligence of someone, where um, you know, they see you as a human trying to do your job, and that also works. So we are trying to appeal both of it together by the ideas that we shared. So my tip for you is to advocate for yourself. So in my scenario, I asked for help. I had a weird scenario. I was like, I didn't like this, and I asked for help. So you do not have to suffer alone if something bad happens. You should definitely ask for help. And the sooner you confront somebody, the sooner you ask for assistance, the better it's going to be. You don't want to let things fester. You can address the issue much easier if you address it head on. But you do probably have to confront somebody. And that's OK. It's scary. It's really awkward to be like, you wronged me in this way. But most people don't necessarily know that they've wronged you. They don't, they're not actively trying to hurt you, right? And so if you need a behavior change, you need to ask for that behavior change. So why should you do this? Because you have the duty to yourself to create a safe and healthy environment that you're going to work in, right? You have to spend like half of your life working. Make it happy. Uh, and finally, assuming the best intentions. So the tips that we have here is, A, we're all here in a you know, like in a working environment, everyone just wants to do their job well. And uh, no one wants to, you know, go to the job and say, I'm going to suck today. You know, I want to fail today. No one wants to do that. So if everybody has that spirit of doing their job well, then the only one thing left to do is aligning with each other to see what does it mean for you to do, do your job well and for me to do my job well. And then where can we find that synergy? Um, second is, a lot of people, a lot of functions see research as a blocker because it takes time, it you know, is a long process, but it is up to us to reframe that narrative. If you're able to show the value that your research is bringing, then I think you know, the ROI is so huge, people are okay spending like six weeks, eight weeks you know, for your research. It, it's no more a blocker, it's an enabler. So that's a narrative that you get to decide for your work. And lastly, just remembering that it's not personal, it's always business. And this is something that took me a lot of time to learn because always seems like when someone is, you know, attacking research, they're attacking you. But you have to really dissociate yourself from that and uh, just not equate their behavior with your self-worth or even like a researcher's self-worth, you know, not even you. Um, why do we suggest this is because it's true. And holding on to contempt or holding on to any negative feeling really about your coworker is very exhausting. Um, it drains you out, it sucks out the joy from your job, and you're not here for this. Life is as it is very difficult. You have family, relationships, so many other things going on. You know, you don't want uh, your coworkers to be the drainers of your energy. All right, so. If we combine our two approaches, I think we have like a super researcher. Yeah. Um, so let's take a look at that. Um, so my approach was self-advocacy, right? It might seem aggressive, it might seem a little extra, but ultimately in my scenario it led to a deeper trust uh, between myself and my partner or my work partner, and it also led to greater visibility of UX research. Aporva's approach on the other hand is more about demonstrating value. And it might seem like a slow burn, a slower process, 
But what we've seen in the Porva scenario is that it's actually led to very strategic opportunities for research. And so what we're taking away here is that there's a lot of different ways to elevate your voice and have your research drive impact, have you drive impact, and to protect your own boundaries. Um, and sometimes, the East and the West, we just need to converge <laughs> and take over the world together. <laughs> So go and get yourself heard. Take what you've learned today and be a boss-ass researcher. Yay. Thank you. <laughs>